discussion keeps the world turning. This is Roundtable. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Roundtable, coming to you live from Beijing. I'm He Yang. Good to have you join us on today's show. Saving a historic building is no small feat, but preserving a whole ancient village is an even greater endeavor. As time races on, how can we organically preserve these precious parts of our history, culture, and traditional way of life? Why is it so crucial to keep these ancient villages intact? And what can we learn from them? Join us for a discussion on the importance. And methods of preserving our cultural legacy, and we're on a mission of starting your week with a motivational kick. Our motivational Monday offerings will get you ready to tackle the week. For today's program, I'm joined by Li Yi and Brandon Yates in the studio. First on today's show. China's traditional village preservation project has made significant strides since its inception in 2012, protecting over 8,000 villages and 556,000 traditional buildings, from artist clusters to ecotourism. These villages are finding innovative ways to thrive in the 21st century. So, give us a recap first since 2020. Actually, 2012. How has this big traditional village preservation project turned out, Li Yi? Sure. I think、uh, before we start the discussion, really we need to identify. I mean, what is exactly those traditional village? And according to some official definition, you know, here in China, it really refers to villages that possess both tangible and intangible cultural heritage, and also those have very significant historical cult. Scientific, artistic, social, and economic value. So this is the basic definition. And here in China, like you said, we do have a very specific policy about the protection and the development of those traditional villages.、Uh, three departments, including China's Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development, published these guidelines of strengthening the preservation and the development of traditional villages on December in December twelve, twenty twelve. And、uh, one highlight of this. Policy is really it's about protection and development, meaning that we are not only you know want those villages to stay the way it it is, but also to sustain and prosper. So this guideline really stressed the importance of why we are doing this because those traditional villages really serve as a bond that maintain the cultural identity of local people、mm. and also preserve the diversity of ethnic cultures here in China,、mm. and also you know those traditional. Villages have a lot of tangible and intangible cultural heritage. So it's really, you know, some people are calling it as the museum of folk culture and also the living fossil of the rural history. So according to these guidelines,、uh, we need to, you know, conduct、uh, relevant efforts that are needed. For example, to improve the whole investigation process of traditional villages. For example, we need to, you know, conduct different field research、uh, in a continuous way, and also we need to establish register. Registers of traditional village at both the national and the local level, and also creating certain management systems and offering technical support. And so far, you know. Uh, since 2012, China really has accomplished the survey and identification of six batches of traditional villages. And data from the、uh, Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development shows that China has 8,155 tra- traditional villages under preservation, and we have protecting over 500,000 traditional buildings and inherits、uh, nearly 6,000 provincial level and above in China. Intangible cultural heritage. So, a total of over five thousand villages have really compiled their own village chronicles, and also relevant efforts have been conducted in at different levels. I believe across the whole country. So, that's the overall. I believe we call t- traditional village protection、mm. and preservation project. As yeah. we call it,、yes. for twelve、yeah, ob- years, all this is、yes. happening. Yeah, and obviously, you know, globally, China has this、uh, tag of being, you know, one of the historical hotbeds in terms of,、uh, you know, historical sites and traditions and values from across the world. And I think so many、uh, traditional Chinese elements have actually had a great influence. On、uh, obviously、uh, Chinese day-to-day life, but also on various on various other countries around the world. So I think obviously protecting certain buildings and traditions and all of that is very important, but also maintaining 
certain elements uh, that date ba- uh, date back many years, but are still you know still very much um, in use today. Um, and ensuring that that can uh, continue to prosper, I think, is also very important. I mean, we have similar things in South Africa where, you know, the protection of languages and cultures and, um, you know, historical sites. Um, and even, you know, it even goes back to uh, the conservation of, of animals that are dying out and all of that sort of thing that's linked to our heritage and our culture and our history. So I think making efforts to protect uh, elements of the past that are still around and also ensuring that uh, you know historical day-to-day ongoings that still exist. Um, I think all of that's very, very important. Yes, I think a lot of the historic villages, uh, like Lee, you mentioned earlier, are kind of like living museums. Some yeah, say they're living because fossils. that's the thing. Like, there's obviously h- historical artifacts and that sort of thing from the past that still exist that need to be protected. But there's also you know, sorts of, sorts of buildings and traditions and practices that do date back thousands of years, but that are still being implemented today. And those also need to be equally protected as much as, you know, um, physical artifacts need to be protected as well. Mm, well, they offer a tangible connection to our past. Yeah. And by preserving these villages, we maintain a physical link to our ancestors, allowing us to understand and appreciate the roots of our cultural identity. And also, this could help foster a sense of continuity and belonging, which is essential for community cohesion, and some would even argue national pride. And also, when you look at folks living in big cities or Cities in general, in the modern urban environment, many people feel disconnected from their cultural roots and heritage, and the fast-paced technology-driven style of life often leaves little room for traditional practices and historical reflection. So by seeking out and preserving historic villages, we can sort of reconnect with um, these um, cultural heritage yeah. and uh, gain a deeper understanding of our identity and history. And also, there is um, a, an educational and economic benefit mm. aspect of things because it's easy. Well, not easy. When we spill out these like more intangible and some might say lofty ideals, people don't miss. It doesn't immediately click with people. But when you say, hey, there's educational and economic benefits, and I think especially the economic benefits, that can help more people to get on board, especially when some people living in these uh, old towns and villages, they might see their living conditions and uh, the immediate surroundings of their homes in a very different light as opposed to, oh, you're just flying in. Um, on a uh, on, on a flight or high speed rail, you get there and then you parachute in. What do you know about the locals' livings, right? So I think it's important to sort of adapt this. Sure, there's the um, top down approach of you know with this preferential policies as such and uh, policy design, which we can talk about, as well as you know this bottom up approach that is you know more responding to the local people's true needs and wants. So um, how do you see these places being preserved um, in that 12 years we've talked about? Well, I think we can refer to one typical example here, that is the Dan village, um, which is currently the largest, oldest, and most well-preserved ancient village discovered in Shanxi province. And the village was also like, it was actually built in one in 1331, so that's about 700 years ago. And there are still over 100 ancient buildings that are really well preserved in this village. And one key effort is really to repair and preserve the ancient architect in the villages. And one, especially when repairing those ancient buildings and, and residences, uh, the whole village really strictly follows the protection plan and repair them with the principle of respecting the original state of cultural relics. And some intangible cultural heritages were really listed as national, provincial, and and the municipal intangible cultural heritage catalog for protection to really to attach the importance to the whole process and also to raising the public awareness. So that is just one example. And also another example I just want to mention is that, you know, um, 
the Huangshan city in Anhui province in eastern China really impressed me because uh, this city is really home to a list of ancient villages. I mean, till now, according to my research, some 300 traditional villages have been really added to the list of traditional Chinese villages on the national level. Mm -hmm. That also make Huangshan ranking second among the country's prefecture level cities in terms of the number. And also when mentioning uh, Huangshan, especially the southern part of Anhui province, uh, people just uh, think about the very unique Hui style ancient mm -hmm. architecture uh, complex there, like the white walls and also the black tiles, a very uh, striking visual contrast and also uh, the very high walls that, that are really known as the uh, Ma Tou Qiang or horse head walls because the top of the walls just look similar to, to the head of horses and they are just uh, used to, pr to prevent the spread of fire. So that's also the very ancient design in like thousand years ago that are still preserved now mm -hmm. and uh, those villages are of course, the very popular tourist de destinations there. And when I visit that, those places, I mean, those small villages, and I find that um, there are still a lot of local residents living in the villages. And more importantly, they're you know, getting so involved in the whole say, tourism sector. Uh, for example, um, those people who have their ancient uh, residence, I mean, the ancient buildings a as their family residence, mm -hmm. um, some of them actually are turned into the uh, tourist attractions in the whole village by the local governments. And uh, so as visitors, you can just uh, simply walk in and, uh, you know, have a tour uh, in the courtyard. And those residents themselves will just tell you the story stories of all, all those buildings mm -hmm. and what happened, you know, uh, maybe within the past uh, thousand years in their own families. And the more and beyond that, they, they can also sell or, you know, present or show their very unique, say, handicrafts or yeah. certain skills that can be intangible cultural heritage for the visitors. So that's just a very typical example of how traditional villages are being turned into tourist attraction. And meantime, also get local people to get involved. Can I also please just add a footnote to that because sure. I also visited that part of yeah. the country and there's a Hongcun yes. Hong village Hongcun. very famous in that area in um, Huangshan Anhui province and I was really surprised uh, by the arrangement of mm. tourism there because with this whole village it, it's quite big um, Sorry, I don't really have the numbers with me here, but um, the way they did it was basically the local um, the local officials would conduct this meeting mm -hmm. and one household would each have a representative for a vote. So they're voting. They voted for are you agreeing to turning this village into a tourism hotspot while maintaining the facade, the looks of the place and then gradually they got everybody on board everybody voted yes and i would think that's a pretty lengthy process I for so. public deliberation <clears throat> yeah i think something linked to that that i sort of have an issue with sometimes not necessarily in areas where people are still living and wanting to earn a living and uh you know improve their standard of living mm -hmm. um i think the conservation efforts in terms of protecting cultural heritage and you know uh cultural sites and historical sites and that sort of thing is very important. But I think that a lot of, not just in China, but around the world, I think a lot of sites have also been rebuilt to a certain extent. I think a lot of uh, the ancient sites have been preserved and a lot of the artifacts and, you know, architecture and that sort of thing has been reserved, but then uh, preserved, sorry, but then uh, additional things have been built on top of that and that's something that I don't necessarily like. I would rather see a ruin that is, you know, actually still intact from hundreds or thousands of years ago as opposed to parts of a ruin that have also been rebuilt to make it look like more modern or more um, preserved. Um, so that's something that I sort of have an issue, issue with but I don't have an issue with that in areas like we've mentioned where people um, are having areas rebuilt where it increases tourism, but it also increases their, uh, their uh, way of life. Um, it betters their life and also increases their opportunities to, to make um, a living by being based in a historical, uh, mm -hmm. historical area. Right. So I think what you mentioned is kind of like the uh, restoration 
process or trend that has evolved in this country as well. Because mm. if you look at, let's say, a few decades ago, um, some places would completely re- rebuild with something new. Yeah. Uh, and uh, with a modern style. Mm. But then in recent decades, we've seen that there's this gradual realization that what is truly unique to your culture and your lo- locality should be maintained. Yes, and preserved, not rebuilt. Yeah. And yeah. even it's even if it's being re- restored, then it should uh, be in cohesion to its original style. Yeah. But I think and, it's also possible to restore without adding if that makes sense. So I think that's Mm -hmm. important for people to bear in mind as well as that, you know, something, there might be only pieces or fragments of a certain historical area or artifact left behind and restoring that as best as possible is very important, but don't add to it or try and change it in some way. That's, that's what I think people need to be very aware of. I think maybe it's really up to the local people and I mean what do they think about what kind of life they want live because when we talk about this, especially a lot of traditional I mean ancient villages usually you know as outsiders we might just appreciate the aesthetic value of mm. say those, those very ancient architecture buildings however maybe for local people some of the design or, or some of those buildings are not really you know uh, proper yeah. yes usable they yeah. might just need some 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 sort of restoration effort but I mean what you said is really about to preserve the very authentic mm. cultural value or the way of life of people there. Right? Yeah, but I, I, but yeah. yeah, so I've actually went to th- these villages in uh, Anhui and then yes. um, I did... Okay, so basically you need to get everybody on board because it's a democratic process, which the locals... Um, will should be honored that's one thing and then also they agreed upon that to go into this village you will need to pay for uh, entry fees so then for all of the households in this village they will get a a portion of that annual entrance fee that's um, an amount that is uh, of of revenue Mm. they can enjoy and also some people decided not to live in that village anymore and some still live there and conduct uh, tours around or whatnot and then what I found to be really interesting again this just shows that outsiders know nothing (laughs) <laughs> or, or actually, or actually, it's just really a complicated issue that mm. I don't think one can come in in ignorance. And I think in a way, it's arrogance to point fingers to say this or that. But anyway, when I went there, I was a little bit surprised by how um, damp, yes, cold and uh, stuffy those um, traditional Hui um, courthouses could be. And mm. this is for um, mostly, I think, average people. They're not the like l- the, the, the elaborate labyrinth of um, courtyards that you see of some super wealthy old family that we have a lot in Chinese history as well. So then when you step in there, it's actually really dark and damp. And also, I, I guess I'm a pretty tall woman. And Back then, I would be a giant, I suppose, if I enter. Oh, and so is is Brandon. <laughs> when I entered, I'm a giant in my own apartment. <laughs> <laughs> when I went into one of these courtyards, and I was like, "Gosh, my my head is gonna hit the ceiling." So you see that these um, houses of hundreds of years they cater towards the needs of people back then. Mm. But now, I can totally understand that why some of the locals would want the house to be. Uh, at least refurbished inside. No, but that's what I'm saying. And, so I and, think and that have... sort of thing is important where people are still living and, you know, taking part in day-to-day life and are, you know, economically benefiting. But for example, in areas or with artifacts where it's not directly impacting people's lives, I think mm. for that preservation is more important than restoration. Mm. But then in areas like you've both mentioned where people are still living and haven't left the area and are actually benefiting from the tourism in that area, then I think their restoration is equally important to preservation. Mm. Yeah. And, and and also I think uh, you mentioned Hongchun, right? Mm-hmm. And also there's an, another well-known village in uh, Huangshan that is CD. Mm, uh, that's yes. of a, a smaller scale compared to Hongchun. And basically you can just uh, take one hour or two hour walk uh, so that you can just visit the whole village. So that's how small it is. And when you, you know, when I was there, I was really quite impressed by the local walk waterways uh, in the whole village. So that was actually built, say, a thousand years ago. And 
and uh, used to be the major project to govern rain or, or offer water supply for the local residents. And what, what really amazed me is that, you know, local residents, they are still using those mm-hmm. waterways, mm-hmm. say, maybe washing vegetables in the river. And as tour guides, they will just like introduce, of course, the design, I mean, the, the design logic of those waterways. And meantime, also tell us you have to respect the way of pe- local people living yes. to today. Yeah. So they're still using those infrastructure and I think as outsiders that's also very important part of the whole visiting experience for me Mm -hmm. because if say there is no one there is no local resident living in the village village, and I just simply appreciate those ancient buildings I don't really consider that's a very impressive tour for me because the way of people living in the ancient time and also to today is also very important for the Mm -hmm. whole local cultural identity Mm -hmm. so that's how local people are preserving their way of life to today as a way to you know preserve their cultural yeah. identity maybe as well i think for me like as a tourist seeing both is equally exciting so seeing a historical artifact that's like 3000 years old and you know seeing that it's been preserved is amazing but also seeing historical sites where people are still living um, is also very impressive and a, a great testament to how history has been preserved and mm-hmm. i think at the end of the day it's a balancing act you know figuring mm-hmm. out how best to preserve historical areas and artifacts, but also being able to restore it to a point where it can still be used and, uh, you know, utilized by locals and also being appreciated by outsiders that are able to come in and view um, what was done in the past and how that is still being preserved today. Mm, And that is a really delicate balance. And let's face it, not a lot of places get it right. So especially when we're talking about, let's say, whole ancient villages and you're going to you're bound to have people who've embraced modern way of life. That is also, you know, going to big cities and find work there and they don't live there anymore. But also uh, to me, I mean, this is from a very possibly a superficial level of understanding. But if you don't have the people living there, then isn't it kind of like the lifeblood of tradition is gone? But also people are changing too. So it's a really interesting sort of mixture of what of what people are doing to keep these places alive. And one p- kind of fashionable way to get new um, inhabitants into these areas is artistic uh, or artist clusters Mm. or inviting um, artists to congregate in some of these small towns and set up workshop there. And when they become clusters, they exude power of uh, the contributing to the economy as well as, you know, in different other aspects. So how do you feel about these uh, artistic sort of uh, clusters that we see in these places? I think that that's just a very creative way of attracting new people to the villages because when you visit those traditional villages, a fact that you just mentioned is actually um, there are a lot of, you know, elderly people living who, who, who choose to stay in the village while they're uh, say kids, grandkids, they just choose to you know go go outside to the town for works. So how to really to preserve you know people really to making contribution to these villages. So uh, uh, inviting say artists and uh, say even people who uh, have their desire of living in villa- in rural areas who, who 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 used to live in big cities and now th- they just decide to live in rural areas can also choose to stay in these traditional villages actually i just uh, encounter one person like that in another small village in uh, in Anhui province oh. and she told me um a lot of local residents of course they choose to uh, leave the vi- uh, the village however there are more people choose to come to the village because they are attracted by how idyllic of those villages are and they just start to start their business either homestay and they have the open their uh a bookstore coffee shops and also <laughs> yeah there are there are a lot of industries going on in those villages and i think that's just a a very say a very modern way of conducting commercial e- e- economies in those mm. villages when when you when we are talking about to let those villages to prosper didn't you and Lai Ming uh, go on a reporting trip a couple of years ago to Jingdezhen yes, the, yes. Uh, in, in Jiangxi province in Jiangxi yeah. province yes and uh, you, you saw lots of uh, artists 
authors and young artists they just、uh, decide to stay and in a small village nearby that's Jinzhou City which, and making porcelain、yes. and really breathing new life to old beings and revive their. Vitality to some、mm-hmm. extent, and also bring in some much-needed revenue for local people.